Hi, and welcome to Beyond Lab Scripting at Scale. My name is Evgeny Smirnov. First of all, I would like to thank the conference organizers for letting me speak at the PSConf for the second time, although it does not involve going to Hanover and hanging out with uh, you guys this year. Second, big thanks to our sponsors, our long-lasting friends from ScriptRunner and System Frontier, PowerShell One, Dr. Tobias Weltner, and of course Microsoft for providing the online platform for this uh, event and uh, conceiving PowerShell in the first place, although I'm not sure if that falls under sponsorship. Uh, today we'll talk about living the lab, uh, going to scale problems that may arise, way to approach those problems and hopefully solve them. I will uh, show you a warm-up exercise and then talk you through two demo scenarios for scaling up and scaling out. Do not expect uh, ready-to-cook recipes. Just follow the train of thought I will be uh, describing here uh, to approach your own problems, your own challenges, and hopefully you'll be able to solve them as well. I'm a practitioner, so uh, everything I'm going to show here is uh, done on Windows PowerShell. If you think PowerShell 7 or cross-platform execution or whatever would be suitable for your uh, specific problem, go ahead and test. We're talking about scripts that have the potential to run for hours or days in a row, so uh, true live demos wouldn't be feasible in this scenario. So I timed them for you and will present the code and the results of the execution uh, to you. You're free to grab the demo code and uh, test that in your demo environment. Don't do this at work without checking with your supervisor. Most of the demo work in this uh, presentation is done on VMs and uh, this imposes some restriction. I will talk about those in a couple of minutes. What is scale? We need to distinguish between scale up, which means large monolithic data sources uh, that may contain some internal substructures, hopefully known to us, uh, and scale out where uh, we need to gather data from many different sources which are in uh, some way connected to each other. That may be server landscapes, uh, event logs, log files, uh, performance counters, IoT infrastructures, IoT data if you, need, if you don't have a proper hub in place or uh, need to gather some uh, counters that your hub uh, does not receive or whatever. Large quantities of data files on file shares all also fall into this uh, category. In this talk, uh, as shown in the abstract, we'll only be talking about gathering data if we need to alter the infrastructure at scale. It's a completely another story. Uh, maybe we can do a workshop or a session on that next year in Hanover. What are the typical challenges when moving out of the lab where uh, all the environment usually runs on my laptop or on a couple uh, of uh, lab machines out to a uh, large infrastructure. A script that delivered results within seconds in the lab runs for like ages in, uh, in the field. So the challenge is to make it faster. Script runs okay, but my performance counter suddenly explode if I start it. So how do I make it consume less resources to not shut down my whole infrastructure? In scale out scenarios, there is that moving target variety where uh, somebody else mm, reboots the server without your knowledge 
or uh, not all servers are online at any time uh, without you being able to plan ahead for up or down times. Environment changes. Uh, that actually depends on the uh, on the nature of data you are collecting. Um, if the environment changes faster than you collect data, you are liable to get a complete data set at some point of time, but this it does not correspond to your actual environment at any given point of time. So need to uh, need to either uh, find a way to make it more consistent. Sometimes a snapshot a day old but consistent in itself is worth more than data which is partly a week old and partly just uh, seconds uh, seconds old, right? So uh, need to look at, uh, at the task at hand and uh, plan accordingly. When leaving the lab and starting running your scripts at scale, there are suddenly a couple of things you have to keep in mind uh, you <clears throat> wouldn't have to be worried about in the lab. Where do which processes actually run? You start some innocuous query and suddenly there is load elsewhere on a SQL server, on a file server, on a domain controller or on some other parts of the infrastructure. How much data is, uh, is transferred over which network? Not all uh, network links are born alike. There is high-speed virtual LAN between two VMs on the same host and there are VPNs or MPLS uh, lines that uh, carry some production traffic uh, and then need to accommodate the data your script uh, is requesting from the other end of the pipe. How much data do I need to store in memory for immediate processing to be consolidated to, uh, to achieve my result and how big is the expected a result set. It could be terabytes of data. It could be actually uh, data lines from some IoT devices or it could be a yes or no answer if I'm looking for, a, for an occurrence of something in my large environment. Think about uh, looking up a book in the library without a catalog. Is there a book named it in the Library of Congress? That's why we have catalogs, right? So my, my way of approaching optimization of scaled scripts is gauge the performance of no approach of known approaches on a small subset of data or a small subset of systems or in a lab to have a set of optimized tools the moment I move out into scale. Using that, optimize the data acquisition technology so we don't lose any time or don't uh, uh, use too much resources there. And then with that done, I will try to use any knowledge available to me about how the data is structured to be able to optimize acquisition of that data. All the time you need to keep an eye on the resource usage uh, so that your infrastructure does not explode. Rules of engagement. Concentrate on the task at hand. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. What I mean by this is you had a script that worked well in the lab. Maybe you use some cool module that abstracts some of the data acquisition. And that module has proven to be too slow for what you need to achieve. 
So do not embark on writing the next module that for some reason or other would be better, faster or whatever. Just solve the, solve the task. You can write the model uh, later if, uh, if you think there is uh, room for optimization there and uh, if there is demand for that module out there in the community, right? No holds barred. Not all code that runs fast or consumes little resources is pretty. And usually you wouldn't be allowed to put ugly code in production, or you shouldn't be. Uh, but in this case, it's okay. It's okay if you know what you're doing, if it's efficient, if it's documented. Right? And as always, do not disrupt. They really need that report they commissioned you to do, but they need to do payroll as well. So if your report delivers on time, but breaks down the payroll because of the resource uh, consumption or file locking or whatever, uh, they won't be all that impressed, right? So. Let's have a look at some code. I've brought you a warming up exercise. Uh, more often than not, at the end of data gathering, there will be writing some results or writing of large quantities of results to a text file, CSV or whatever. Let's look at uh, various approaches to that and uh, how they time in relation to each other. Uh, there will be um, these slides with some code. I've included them for posterity, but in, uh, in the recording we'll uh, uh, be looking at the live code and maybe uh, even run that. So, uh, We'll try to generate a million lines of code and write them out into a text file. Simple as, simple as that. We generate the uh, code in memory. We'll be using an array list for that. Don't, please don't try using uh, PowerShell arrays for a million uh, lines. That's not going to end well. Well, it, it will end well, but uh, uh, the weight is frustrating. So then we generate uh, those files. Not very creative here. Uh, uh, we just, uh, we just may, uh, take the numbers from uh, zero to uh, one million and pad them uh, with uh, zeros uh, to uh, 16 characters and uh, just add those 16 byte uh, or 16 character strings to the uh, array. Right? And then what do we have? Of course, the PowerShell way of doing that is out file. Um, we can also do set content or uh, we can drop down to .NET classes and uh, I use the StreamWriter. The StreamWriter has the ability to write the whole array out, but it will not insert any line breaks. So we need to do this line by line to achieve the identical results to the previous ones. And uh, of course, there is the uh, system I.O. Uh, a file namespace where we have write all lines and uh, be done with that. So now let me check if I actually have the target folder. Nope. I haven't. Uh, 
all right now we have okay now we have it so we can run the script And it took us to gen uh, three seconds to generate one million entries in the RAM. It will take us some time. It's running uh, on a laptop with two SSDs in it, uh, i7 processor, 16 gigs of RAM that are not uh, used for anything else beside the PowerPoint, the recording and uh, this code. So out file took 24 seconds. Set content cut this, uh, that in half. The stream writer, although ran in the loop, got uh, to to the finish line in four seconds. So uh, basically a sixth of the out file time and write all lines from the I/O file. Uh, namespace uh, finished under one second a third of a second actually which brings us to one important point i will rush you through this i put some timing on this and as you can see the times are very different the reason for that is that uh, the tests in the powerpoint we ran on a VM and I didn't realize until later on that that actually had been a server VM configured for background processing, right? If I reconfigured it for foreground and the results were very close to what I was getting on hardware, not quite there, but since the VM wasn't constrained in any way, uh, I got very similar results. Which leads to an important point about this talk. Your mileage may vary. And it will vary even if you uh, reproduce my uh, tests in your environment. But I use the methodology in doing these tests that should deliver similar relative results in any environment. So things that have ran twice as fast in my environment should uh, run twice as fast in yours. Despite varying uh, uh, absolute, absolute measurements, right? So uh, how about reading back? Because uh, reading data from flat text files is also a, an important part of many data gathering uh, endeavors. So let's just uh, try to read that file that we just gener generated back into RAM. Here's the code. We just set a stopwatch. So we can have the times. Okay, the file is is there, I hope. But hmm, just generated that. So what methods do we have at our disposal? Get content from the input file. We can use the stream reader. Same restrictions as in writing the file, we need to read the file line by line to uh, uh, get an array of strings and not a single very large string. And of course, here is the system IO file namespace that has that nifty read all lines method that uh, delivers our an array. So. Let's run this.
set content took 12 seconds to write into the file it takes 20 seconds to to read that file back and the times that stream reader and io file read all lines deliver are similar to uh, to the previous example so we have 20 seconds for get content and uh, uh, half a second for uh, read all lines <coughs> it's an improvement of 40 times uh, so uh, to achieve basically the same result right so why is it important let's say you have a script that runs for a minute and you want to optimize that script you could probably shave off half of the time by just uh, using another method of writing or reading uh, the initial data okay so that's why I'm talking about this you get a large result set but your uh, execution time is measured by uh, the generation of, of a result file so it's worth a while to actually look at how fast you can output that file okay Another popular exercise is looking for patterns in files. Now this is one thing the PowerShell team has done right. If you only need to know if one of the patterns is found somewhere in all those many files there's hardly anything faster than select string with the quiet switch the quiet switch does an early breakout the quiet switch aborts the execution as soon as okay select string with the quiet switch um, outputs a true or a false it outputs a boolean result result and as soon as true can be output the quiet switch stopped the execution of the uh, of the uh, commandlet so if uh, if your pattern if the first of your patterns is found in the first line of your first file uh, it uh, hardly uh, takes any time to execute of course, if, the pattern, if none of the patterns is found uh, in any of the files, uh, it will take as long or maybe longer than, <clears throat> uh, uh, than the alternatives. And uh, if you need to do a select string over multiple files, it's usually faster to just, um, to just supply the paths to all the files than to get content uh, of those files in arrays and then uh, and then pass the input objects to select string however they uh, do that it's usually faster to have select select string deal with the files uh, itself okay so we, we will need that results uh, in a couple of minutes that's why I'm talking about it now let's look at the first uh, real-life scenario scaling up it's a scale up scenario involving Active Directory I chose Active Directory because everybody knows Active Directory right I worked for a Microsoft shop I worked for a Citrix shop I worked for a VMware shop um, <clears throat> yeah everybody is supposed to know Active Directory the reality may be another story but most everybody knows what it does and that's sufficient for whatever uh, uh, we are um, uh, trying to achieve here now imagine it's 1645 uh, 445 p.m. on Friday and then your boss uh, 
needs a list of all these SEM account names in your Active Directory. That should be a piece of cake. Doesn't doesn't take a minute, but yeah, you got it. You, you got it right on your desk. Okay, so hold my beer, guys. Every time I see this string in production, I have to cringe, but I keep running into it in production, in corporate environment, on a regular basis. Somebody must, must have put it on the internet years ago, and now people who do not think about what they're doing are just using it. What does it do? I mean, uh, a filter, um, filter star. It's okay for the task at hand because we do want uh, everybody's SAM account name, right? But we tell the commandlet to return any properties any of those AD user ADs have set only to later select one of those properties, nam namely the same account name, right? Look out for this kind of goofiness in the scripts. Somebody can have put that in there years ago and nobody ever looked twice uh, since. So uh, it, even in, in scripts that are considered to be optimized in some way, uh, I really see these things on, uh, on a regular basis. So what happens? We started 16, uh, 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 64, uh, 46, sorry. It's 1715, 30 minutes wait, and then this. Invalid enumeration context, red error, and the output is empty. So we waited for 30 minutes. We didn't get one result back and uh, the boss is frustrated. So now it worked on my laptop, right? What kind of environment are we looking at here? It's a single domain AD for us, so get AD user filter star was okay for that also. Consists of four domain controllers. They are virtualized on vSphere, but they are not constrained in any resource. Every one of them has access to a, a separate SSD uh, to enough uh, CPU cores uh, and enough RAM to serve the ntds.dit completely from memory which is a large amount of RAM, because if we take a look at the file, we're looking at 20 gigabytes of NTDS DIT, and there isn't a single object deleted from that uh, AD since its uh, inception. We have 1.5 million, roughly, give or take, user object in that uh, directory, as well as uh, close to a million other other objects, computer groups, uh, group memberships, etc. Right. So it's a large environment. It's probably larger than anything we get to work with on a daily basis. But still, there should be a way to uh, get that uh, to get that uh, task achieved in a timely manner. Right. So step one, optimizing data acquisition. Get a D user. It's not bad in itself, but it pulls too much data, which need to be 
written to the output by the domain controller and need to be transferred uh, over the network that needs to be read by the network stack uh, on my workstation and that needs to be stored in memory until uh, I discard it. This is the minimum set of data for a user object that, uh, uh, that I can persuade get a user to deliver. I could add more properties, but, but I can't uh, subtract any of those you see on the screen. And I only actually need one of them. Now, uh, what do we have at our disposal? Of course, ADSI. ADSI Searcher has three advantages. It delivers only the data we're looking for. It avoids the middleware because that error we saw earlier does not come from AD. It comes from the uh, API, the Active Directory PowerShell module from Windows is talking to, namely, uh, namely uh, Active Directory web services. And that's a limitation of that. I'll look at that in a second. I've included some, uh, some information for your uh, reference. And um, last but not least, Artsy Searcher is available on any Windows box. You don't need to check if the Active Directory PowerShell module is installed or not. This guy you can run from every Windows box that has .NET on it. So, let's do a comparison. We do get results uh, from from uh, get ad user if we uh, if we uh, leave uh, the first uh, the first star in place but uh, get rid of the second one so with a minimum set of data that get ad user uh, is going to give uh, uh, give back we do get some results in 12 minutes so it would have been sufficient for uh, our uh, five o'clock uh, uh, for our five o'clock on Friday. Adsy Searcher, on the other hand, will deliver those same results that we need: a list of semicolon names in two minutes and a half. Let's look at the code. So we have a list of our four domain controllers. I'm actually cheating. I'm importing the Active Directory module before the clock starts, but um, uh, I think it's okay. And then <clears throat> we just get a user from a domain controller of our choice and then select the semicolon names. In the second, in the second uh, region, we initialize an Adsy Searcher with a user filter. We tell him to only load the semicolon names for us. We don't need any other uh, properties. And then we just say find all and output the semicolon name. This guy is important. When working with Adsy Searcher, with directory services namespace from .NET, almost any property returned is an array. And in many cases, it's an array containing only one member, but an array nonetheless. So if you do not explicitly um, select the first member uh, you you get you get different results from uh, what we're trying to achieve and then we just dump uh, dump the results in a file I cannot run it yet uh, here 
because because mine the main controllers are down but you've seen uh, the printouts the screenshots here uh, 1.5 million results roughly um, acquired in 156 seconds from uh, by by Atsu Searcher and uh, 680 seconds from uh, from a get AD user. Now, think cloud. If I throttle the network connection between my workstation and the DCs, I get the same breakdown uh, error that I've seen uh, initially. After 30 minutes, it could be something there. As the searcher delivered uh, the expected results, uh, well, the time the time has uh, increased six folds, but uh, seeing that uh, we, we decreased the network bandwidth by a factor of 100, uh, it, uh, it, it may be uh, okay. So what happened here? 30 minutes. We had seen 30 minutes before. There is a 30 minutes timeout in ADWS. It's documented. I've uh, included a slide for your uh, reference. If you consider tinkering, tinkering with that, you should probably save that website locally because it's uh, from previous versions adws was introduced with server 2003 as um, as an additional download and built into server 2008 so microsoft is going to be retiring this content some time in the future next one let's see if we can optimize our execution time by an internal knowledge of the structure of our data. As I said earlier, we have four domain controllers at our disposal. And if we look at the OU where uh, uh, we have our production objects, we see that it has 20 sub OUs under it and nothing else. So it's safe to assume that all those 1.5 million results uh, or objects reside somewhere within that tree. Now let's try and do this in parallel because all these objects are present on all four domain controllers so we can, could fan out the queries and uh, just ask every of the four domain controllers to deliver sub results from five uh, of these sub OUs. Okay, let's try that. Here's the code. Uh, we won't be uh, using get 80 user anymore because, um, well, we have seen that uh, Etsy searcher works faster. Now, uh, first we need to get a list of sub OUs. Um, here I uh, decided to, to do that from the DC number one. And, uh, but since, uh, since it only, uh, uh, it's only going to deliver 20 results, it's, uh, it's okay because that doesn't put any load uh, on that DC. And then I put my uh, I put my semicount name gathering exercise uh, within Etsy Searcher in the script block. The script block expects a uh, distinguished name, which will include the domain controller name uh, as a parameter. And then I just go ahead and. Um, uh, and uh, shoot them out to uh, to subsequent domain controllers. And when when I uh, when I'm out of domain controllers, I start 
at the beginning. How long does it take? So, over a fast network link, we're down to 40 seconds execution time. We're down to 40 seconds execution time plus one second to write the results in the file. From 12 minutes unoptimized get AD user to 40 seconds for 1.5 million results. So this is uh, 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 this could be considered a hold my beer results, I think. But what happens, think cloud, if we decrease the network bandwidth? Well, it does get faster, but not by as much. But not by as much as I would expect. We're down to 500 seconds from 880. So let's uh, let's see if we can uh, if we can optimize that. The obvious choice would be to use the domain controllers. I tried that. So this is a script block that takes a distinguished name of an OU and a DC name as, as uh, parameters and then it defines another uh, script block. So the first, the first layer of script blocks will be executed locally in local run spaces and then they will have the inner script block executed remotely by invoke command on those DCs. So I have each DC query five OUs locally from that DC itself. Unfortunately, that does not deliver any optimization over uh, over a slow network, quite on the contrary, uh, it will uh, it uh, it becomes somewhat slower, slower, and uh, well, my next step would have been looking for a uh, machine on the DC network, and then running the whole script from there just getting the results back. The results amount to uh, roughly 17 max, so it shouldn't be uh, shouldn't take long to transfer the file that gets written uh, over the 10 uh, meg network uh, to my workstation. So I would I would expect quite an a potential for optimization uh, there basically we would be probably down to one minute 40 seconds generation in that remote network segment and further 10 to 15 seconds to transfer the file. That's all there is to the first exercise. Now let me rush you through the scale out, uh, scale out challenge. <clears throat> IIS logs. Most everybody can relate. PowerShell admins can relate. IIS admins, SQL Server reporting services admins, most everybody can relate to IIS logs. So now let's imagine a web server form. 50 of them all serving basically the same application in a load balanced kind of way. Those servers are not optimized for running under load. There are CPU and disk constraint, meaning they share less CPU resources than what they would need to run at 100% all at once. They are not RAM constrained, but they haven't got uh, too much RAM either. You've seen, uh, we will 
we will try and adjust the network speed between our works, workstation and that server form, think cloud. And uh, all of those servers have been running basically for three years. So each one uh, has generated about a thousand log files. The likely objectives in such an exercise are which of the IP addresses X, Y, Z, etc. have access, accessed the website at all. Think a marketing campaign and I'd like to see if the uh, competition have discovered the website and visited it. At least the obvious uh, uh, source IPs. Which of the IP addresses have access, accessed a certain, a certain resource on the file servers? How many times has a certain resource been accessed. In a real world web server farm uh, operation, you'll have some log consolidation in place done in real time because this is the kind of data the, the guys who operate web server farms actually need. But I've seen more than once that uh, nobody ever thought about introducing uh, some logging and then they needed answers to those questions and then uh, everybody was happy at least some logs were in place so let's look at the first objective and uh, you can uh, you can try and solve the rest in your home lab uh, because we won't have uh, time for uh, for those other uh, uh, shiny uh, questions. Which of the IP addresses have access to the website at all? Technically, it's a simple pattern matching, but there is no knowing which nodes they accessed. It's a load balancer. It just directs uh, requests to web servers on a round-robin basis. There is no knowing when they exist it, so uh, we can't say look for the first 100 files and uh, and uh, they could, couldn't could have accessed uh, uh, that more than 100 days ago. So in the best case all patterns are found within the first log on the very first node, so uh, we, we can stop looking and uh, uh, and say yes, all those addresses uh, have accessed uh, this farm uh, re quite recently. Worst case, sorry, worst case is one of the patterns or any of those are not found at all. So we have no choice than to scan all the files, every single one of them, and uh, make certain the patterns are not there. So let's start by uh, getting the lay of the land, uh, by just uh, gauging what kind of performance we can get out of this setup. We don't look at this stage, we don't look into the files uh, themselves. Let's start by just counting uh, uh, and getting the sizes of uh, those log files. Let's look at some code. We are a local admin on all those uh, servers, so we could just Okay, here I'm uh, generating generating the list of computers. They have, fortunately for us, uh, a distinct naming pattern. So they uh, are named WLIIS 2049 And uh, I could start by just querying the administrative shares. This uh, path here amounts to uh, computer name, C$, dollar, and then the init pop default log files directory. P the PowerShell way of enumerating files is get child item. I can, uh, I can do that 
and then I measure uh, the sum of their uh, respective length, which uh, gives me a uh, length, uh, the uh, file size of all the files in, uh, in each share in bytes, uh, which I convert to megabytes, and then um, then for the output, I convert them in gigabytes, right? That would be uh, searching the files or enumerating the files over the network. Then we can do the same thing in parallel, exactly the same. We are uh, enumerating over the C sharp share, but but uh, doing it in parallel. I could have done all this uh, stuff with jobs as well, but that doesn't have any any uh, performance advantages. So uh, I, I, I know run spaces, so I chose I chose to use run spaces. You're free to use jobs. It's it's, it's just as well. <clears throat> and then uh, and then I can. Uh, gather all those results from finished run spaces and of course I could shoot the local enumeration which I expect to be faster than remote enumeration out to the web servers themselves and then just uh, accumulate the results let's look at the numbers Over a gigabit network, the PowerShell method delivers uh, the results in seven seconds, .NET method in, in the .NET equivalent in two and 25 seconds. In parallel, we drop to two seconds in PowerShell and uh, under, uh, under a second in .NET which is quite cool for uh, like uh, 50,000 files. The remote execution takes considerably longer. Another results we're getting here is that while a slower network does introduce a significant uh, increase in the execution time for remote uh, for uh, share enumeration it has almost no uh, it has almost no effect on the remote execution the 44 seconds um, in the right bottom corner I think it's an outlier but however remember I said those guys are CPU constrained so if I execute stuff remotely on them all at once they just get in the way of each other and the farm gets congested and the uh, monitoring lights go red and the guys who manage the server farm uh, come looking for, for my scalp, right? So this is probably not the way to go, except it, except it is. Because we've got a copious amount of data that we need to sift through to get a negligible result set. Right? We have four IP addresses, so we need four yes or no answers. And for that, we need to sift through 500 plus gigs of files. So what shall we do? We're not transporting that data over the network. We need to do the analysis remotely on the web servers. We need to keep an eye on the local resource source usage and we need to evaluate any early breakout possibilities that are there. 
So we're running out of time. So I'll rush you, rush you through the rest and um, just let's look at some gauging exercise for select strings. Here's where we need to make a design decision. You cannot do an early breakout in uh, in a select string. It will, in the sense that you need to invoke select string for every IP. You need the yes or no for every IP. If you need, if we needed a yes or no uh, for all four IPs for so has any of those IPs access the farm would only have to call select string once with all the files and all the um, all the patterns in one call per computer that would take some time probably depending on whether we have the best or worst case, but that would be it. Since we need the yes or no answer for every one of those IP addresses, we need to call select string once per IP. Now this doesn't give us an early breakout in the sense that uh, if all three IPs are found in the first file, we still need uh, uh, to to we, we still need to uh, scan all the files for the for the fourth uh, if we're querying for fourth IPs. So now let's look at. Uh, at the possibilities to, to, to achieve an early breakout, we can uh, we can either look through through the IPs first, and for each IP, we look through the files and break out of the inner uh, uh, inner uh, loop when we found the current IP in question. Or we can do the opposite and uh, loop over the files first. And then for each file, we look at the IPs. And if we found all of them, we're done. That's the that's one of the cases where nobody can tell in advance which will be faster. So you need to gamble. You need to gamble. Um, maybe if you if you're prepared to wait for a no on all fours for a day, but would like the yes or no on the first in in a second if it's there then iterating through uh, IP addresses might be better on the other hand the systems are constrained and the second approach has the potential to reduce the number of, pro of uh, processing cycles you need if you're close to the worst case meaning that uh, all the patterns are found against the end or not at all, right? Look, look at this code. And there are some ideas in there, but this is one of the cases where I can give you a do or don't. You need, you need to experiment here. The performance of the remote execution in the worst case scenario 
this is interesting running remotely <clears throat> we put the machine under strain of 50% CPU and for this test I chose a machine that wasn't constrained or I made one of the machines unconstrained by shutting down uh, by shutting down the rest um, it still ran for 18 minutes consuming 50% of CPU so uh, you you need to you need to keep an eye uh, open for that guys As I said earlier, select string choir does early breakout all by itself. You need to uh, you need to write code around this. Uh, just uh, just use it if you can use that. And uh, in the CPU constraint scenario, I goofed on the last uh, imp very impressive uh, screenshot. In the best case. Even in the best case, where all the patterns are found on every machine in every single file, you get an increase of about a factor of five if you let it run on all 50 machines uh, at the same time. So how could you how how could could you reduce that? Drop pauses, select sleeps in your in your calls in your loops. You also can try and reduce the priority of your own execution. The code below actually works. You can run stuff remotely and uh, tune down the priority of the remote execution. Of the remote uh, run space at the same time, but do reset it to normal because it uh, it's persisted persisted un uh, until the system is rebooted. What if there are chaos monkeys? This is where I don't have any recipes, but you guys are smart and you can think of stuff you could do. If you need to run remotely against many machines those machine machines could not be up at the time that you start and they could go down intermittently while you run so you need some way of persisting results and rerunning the remote sessions if the machines keep coming back one last time one last slide, daily business. If you need results like the ones I have spoken about on a regular basis, it can save you some cycles if you use differential queries. Persist results in a way you can get at them quickly and then just use a differential. In searching AD it's a timestamp, you don't need the objects that didn't change uh, since the last execution. You only need those that <coughs> were created or changed since you last uh, pulled the results, right? Same thing about the IIS logs. If you already found one IP, there's no need to requery for that. And it's there's no need to requery for logs you already analyzed. But IIS servers keep producing logs so you could uh, start only querying the um, like those uh, since the last execution and that's all uh, for this session it's it took long enough to summarize concentrate on the task at hand don't reinvent the wheel always plan for early breakout if possible Think one step ahead, you might need the results uh, in memory for a bit longer and be prepared to end up with some ugly code. If it's sufficient, if it's documented, if you know what you're doing, it's okay. Experiment in advance. 
with an added benefit of getting to know your systems. Plan for interruption, use differentials, and keep an eye out for dumb artifacts in your scripts like uh, get 80 user uh, star star. Watch out for VMs. If you're running stuff on VMs, uh, watch out for background and foreground processing. And don't use PowerShell array uh, classes. Drop down to uh, .NET. It uh, saves time and resources. Thank you very much. Uh, slides and demo codes can be found on GitHub. I'm not sure if uh, they uh, have already been uploaded, but uh, they will be as a matter of days. And if you want to get in touch, you're very welcome. Hit me up on Twitter, email. I've got some uh, websites, user groups, and uh, here is a QR code for you where you can um, grab that information uh, to your smartphone. And hopefully see you all in best health and full of new PowerShell ideas next June in Hanover at the PowerShell Conference Europe 2021. Thank you very much.